Yeah, so in my paper, I'm going to be presenting some of my recent research on graphic journalism, an emergent journalistic approach that relies on the medium of comics storytelling. Given that the work of graphic journalists has often focused on the <coughs> aftermath of wars and other disasters, when I began this research as part of my doctoral work in communication studies at Concordia University, my focus was really on this emergent form's potential for representing disasters. However, <laughs> some of the most interesting findings of this research really turned out to be about the potential of this emergent form of journalism for representing data. And as I'm currently trying to figure out how best to connect this research on graphic journalism with recent work on visualization in the area of critical data studies, I would very much appreciate feedback from all of you on this paper. Welcome. All right. So there's been quite a lot of recent interest in the question of how journalists might best visually present large, complex data sets to the public. And this is commonly done in journalism by the creation of a chart based on numeric data. However, in these data visualizations, information about the source of the data is typically relegated to a small text box, either under the chart or beside it. And this would seem to um, offer the public with very little context about how particular data sets are gathered and why. So in light of the growing power and ubiquity of data, all the issues that we're talking about at this conference, there would seem to be an urgent need for more critical approaches to data visualization in the field of journalism that would provide readers with relevant context about how particular data sets are created and why. And in this paper, I'm going to propose that the form of graphic journalism might offer one possible strategy. I'm going to present this paper in three parts. I'll begin by introducing graphic journalism and comparing this emergent visual form to some of the strategies more commonly used in journalism to visualize data. In the second part of my presentation, I'll discuss the approach I used in my research on graphic journalism, which involved producing an original work of graphic reportage that draws on the main set of official statistics on displacement in Haiti after the 2010 Haitian earthquake. And I'll conclude by presenting some of the key findings of this research. Through specific examples from my graphic reportage project, I'll show that working in this emergent form of journalism allowed me to effectively communicate not only data on displacement in Haiti, but also critical context about how and why displaced Haitians were counted in the first place. And I'll also show that working in this medium allowed me to explore the perspectives of some of the people whose data were being collected. So graphic journalism is an emergent journalistic approach that relies on the medium of comic storytelling. It was first popularized, in English at least, by the work of Joe Sacco, a self-described comics journalist who has published several award-winning books in this medium, as well as several shorter works that have appeared in publications such as Harper's, The Guardian, and The New York Times Magazine. In recent years, graphic journalism has also been growing in reach on digital platforms. For instance, the BBC, Huffington Post, The Guardian, the Center for Investigative Reporting, and Medium have all published graphic reportage online. Now, graphic journalism has rarely been discussed as a form of data visualization, per se. However, graphic journalists do quite often draw on numeric data in their work. For instance, in this excerpt from a piece of graphic reportage by Andy Warner on the effects of the current war in Syria on Syrian children, you can see that Warner cites various relevant statistics. Yet graphic journalism also has some important differences from the data visualization strategies more commonly used in, in journalism. 
The first level at which these differences can be observed is a methodological one. In recent discussions and popular guides to data visualization in the field of journalism, the process of visualizing data is typically approached as something that should begin with a numeric data set. The Data Journalism Handbook, for instance, specifies that in visualizing data, quote, everything you need, everything you create needs to originate from a series of atomic charts and graphs. In contrast, graphic journalists have generally emphasized that they begin their work with interviews. Graphic journalism also differentiates itself by its form from the types of charts commonly used to visualize data in journalism. For unlike these more standard forms of data visualization, in which the text is typically used simply to identify the source of the data being visualized, graphic journalists' medium of comic storytelling allows them to combine, juxtapose, and layer different forms of visual, textual, and numeric language. And another formal characteristic of graphic reportage that makes it particularly different from, say, a typical journalistic chart is its reliance on dialogue. For dialogue plays a very important role in this visual approach, as it does in the medium of comic storytelling more broadly. <coughs> so the approach that I used in my research on graphic journalism builds on the methods of reflexive practice-based research, or practice-led research, or what is more commonly known here in Canada as research creation. In such research, it is quite common for researchers to experiment with new practices of journalism or media making, often by actually producing an innovative media project or work of journalism. In the specific context of my research, this involved testing out graphic journalism as both a methodology and as a form. And I did this by researching, writing, illustrating, and designing an original work of graphic reportage. Throughout this process, I also reflected critically on the production of this project. And as a researcher with a background working as a journalist, I reflected particularly on what the methods and form of graphic journalism meant for the practices of research, writing, and visual presentation that I was used to using in my work as a journalist. So I carried out the field work for this graphic journalism project in Haiti in 2013. To give you a little bit of context, this was three years after Haiti was hit by a devastating earthquake. Just in the capital of Port-au-Prince, Haiti's most densely populated city, 30% of the housing was destroyed in this earthquake, which struck on January 12, 2010. Throughout the country, people who'd lost their homes in this disaster took refuge in makeshift encampments on what seemed like every possible open piece of land. Even today, very little of the housing that was destroyed in this disaster has been rebuilt, while the cost of rent, which was already quite unaffordable for many Haitian families even before the quake, has skyrocketed. Yet in 2013, as I began my field work, the Haitian government and various international agencies and NGOs were working to close Haiti's camps through relo relocations programs. I began my field work in Petionville camp, one of these Haitian camps that was being closed at the time through an official relocations program. During my field work, I recorded interviews with a range of humanitarian stakeholders, including international humanitarian workers and landowners. Yet the majority of my interview interviewees were displaced Haitians themselves who lived in this camp. And based on these interviews, I wrote the script for a nonfiction graphic novel and began the process of illustrating and designing sample pages for this book like book-length work of graphic journalism, which I've called Picturing Aid in Haiti. So there were three findings of this graphic research project that I would propose have particular significance for anyone concerned with the question of how journalists visualize data. In this research, I found that graphic journalism has particular advantages for first, documenting critical context about data, second, for communicating this context about how and why data are gathered. And third, for exploring the perspectives of people whose data are being collected. I'm going to elaborate on each of these research findings by showing you some examples from my graphic journalism project. I'll begin by elaborating on the first finding of my research. Partly because of the important role of interviews in graphic journalism, 
whose form can also facilitate access to people it might be harder for journalists working in more standard media forms to interview. I found that this approach has advantages for documenting critical context about data. As I mentioned earlier, graphic journalism distinguishes itself from the data visualization approaches more commonly used in journalism by its methods, in which interviews play a particularly important role. Now, interviews are also a very common method used in other forms of journalism. Yet in my research, I found that working in the form of graphic journalism can actually facilitate access to people it would be harder to interview in a more standard form of journalism. As an example, I'm next going to talk about my process of using graphic journalism's interview-based methods to report on a data set that has played a hugely important role in official and media discussions of displacement in Haiti since the 2010 earthquake. This data set is called the displacement tracking matrix. The displacement tracking matrix, or the DTM as it is known for short in the humanitarian world, is widely considered to be the main source of data on Haiti's displaced population. It is also, by the way, being used in about 18 other countries to, tr dis to track um, and monitor displaced populations. So it is collected and published by the International Organization for Migration, an intergovernmental agency that began counting the population of Haiti's camps in the weeks after the earthquake of January of 2010. In the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, the IOM, IOM as it is called more commonly by its acronym, counted approximately 1.5 million people living in Haiti's camps. According to the agency's latest report, which is featured here, there are now fewer than 47,000 Haitians living in these camps. Now, it's hard to overstate the importance of this data in official and media discussions of the issue of displacement in Haiti. For these statistics, document and documenting a decline in the number of people living in Haiti's camps really became the benchmark that various governments, international agencies, and journalists used to evaluate the success of the official relocation relocations programs. However, in researching my graphic journalism project, I, documenting a very, I documented a very concerning limitation of these statistics, namely, Despite an ongoing epidemic of cholera, a deadly disease to which people living in camps are particularly vulnerable, the IOM has not been counting the number of deaths in these camps. It was the interviews that I recorded with residents of Petionville camp, many of whom knew people who had died in their camp, that first drew my attention to this issue. And it was through an interview I recorded with a data analyst at the IOM that I was able to document the concerning fact that such deaths are not counted at all in official statistics on Haiti's displaced population. Now you might say, OK, but couldn't you have documented this critical context through some other form of journalism? To which I would respond, I don't think that I necessarily could have. In fact, some of the displaced Haitians that I interviewed confirmed to me that they would not have spoken to me had I been working in another form of journalism. It's hard to really convey the kind of precariousness in which residents of these camps in Haiti lived. In Petionville camp, like in many camps throughout Haiti, rapes were very common. There were also people in this camp who had been recently killed by gun violence when I began my research. Camp residents were very conscious that they do not even have, did not even have walls for protection. And they lived in a state of almost indescribable insecurity. And for this reason, many of those living in the camp feared repercussions for speaking out publicly. Some of the camp residents I spoke to were quite explicit that they would not, that they would have been afraid to be interviewed for platforms such as TV or radio. Yet interestingly, these same camp residents were willing to be interviewed for a graphic reportage project. One of these displaced Haitians, <coughs> the woman I refer to in this project as Marie Pierre, who told me that her own daughter had died in the camp about a year after her family arrived, after falling ill. Working in the form of graphic journalism also facilitated my access to the private views of humanitarian professionals at organizations like the International Organization for Migration, or the IOM. Interestingly, the IOM data analyst I interviewed mentioned before we began the interview 
that she was typically required to seek approval for media interviews from the IOM's Media Relations Office. As any journalist knows well, such institutional pro protocols are often designed to ensure that statements that the staff of agencies like the IOM make in the media conform to the scripts of pre-established institutional messages. However, partly because I was working in the form of comics, a somewhat unusual form of journalism, these protocols were not applied to the interview I recorded with this data analyst. And there was, as a result, when I asked how the de deaths in Hades camps are counted in the DTM, I got a very straight answer, namely that they aren't. The data analyst also gave me quite a detailed overview of exactly how the IOM goes about counting displaced Haitians through this tracking matrix. She explained that following the earthquake, the IOM, oh, the IOM, um, following the earthquake, the IOM gathered detailed information about each family living in Haiti's camps, including the number of members of each family and their contact information. This was done through a procedure referred to by those involved in the DTM as the registration. However, according to the data analyst, the statistics the IOM publishes on Haiti's displaced population are gathered through a wholly different procedure of the displacement tracking matrix called the rapid camp assessment. Unlike the registration, this rapid assessment is based only on aggregate data, which the agency produces based on the number of tents it counts, with, sometimes with the aid of drone technologies. During this interview, I also asked the data analyst if there were any records being kept of deaths in Haiti's camps. And to the best of her knowledge, there really aren't. But what was even more significant was the way in which she explained this striking omission. Namely, she told me, and this is direct quote, that here we don't really measure how a program is working with the number of deaths. For us, the indicator is decrease of people in camps because we want to close camps. This context has often been missing in the public statements by official spokespeople from the IOM, who've called the decrease in the number of Haitians in camps, quote, hopeful signs that many victims of the quake are getting on with their lives, as the IOM spokesman put it in one press release. Other international agencies, such as the UN, meanwhile, have referred to this decrease as, quote, unquote, progress. So to summarize, the first finding of my research, the interview methods of graphic journalism, whose form also facilitated my access to different perspectives, allowed me to document a very striking omission in this da data that has often been presented to the pro public as progress. But that's not all. I also found that graphic journalism's medium of comic storytelling, which allows one to combine, complement, and juxtapose many different forms of textual and visual language, has benefits for communicating critical context about data. In the specific case of my own graphic journalism project, I found that this medium, which allowed me to use images as well as dialogue, offered particular advantages for presenting my readers with critical context about the statistics the IOM has presented to the public as a sign that displaced Haitians are, quote, getting on with their lives, unquote. For instance, oh. For instance, this drawing I made as part of my research using the IOM's drone imagery of Petionville camp as visual reference material foregrounds the perspective from which Haitians living in camps appear to those responsible for counting them, a type of viewpoint that Mark Andreevich has critically theorized in his recent work on the drone perspective. And in this this excerpt from the script I wrote for the book-length work of graphic journalism I plan to publish based on this research, Comics Dialogue works to communicate the IOM data analyst's own explanation of why the agency doesn't count deaths in Hades camps. Something that has also been critically analyzed in a lot of recent work on indicators and how they are being used in all areas of public policy. The medium of comic storytelling thus allowed me to convey critical information about how and why displaced Haitians are counted, context that I believe it would have been far more difficult for me to convey in a standard journalistic chart with a text box. In my research, I also found that this medium presented a third important advantage over the data visualization strategies more commonly used in, in journalism. Namely, I found that due to the important role that dialogue plays in graphic journalism, working in this form had advantages for exploring the perspectives of people whose data are being collected. 
Due to the important role dialogue plays in the medium of comic storytelling, working in this medium encouraged me to cite frequently and at length from the people that I interviewed. For instance, in this excerpt from my project, I cite directly from an interview I recorded with Marie Pierre, who told me, Petit moi t'es malade en bas prélat, dit mourir n'a qu'à en moi masse, or as I translate her words in the English version of this project, which I also plan to publish in Haitian Creole. My daughter got sick under the tarp. She died in the camp of in the camp in March of 2012. So in this way, I found the <coughs> comics working in the medium of graphic journalism allowed a way for both documenting and communicating critical context about how and why data are gathered. An experience that I think has, has interesting imp implications as we talk about how might um, people like journalists best think about visualizing complex data sets in ways that, that engage the public. Thank you. Good afternoon. Many thanks for having us here. Um, like our colleagues in the session, we'll be uh, looking at data power from the perspective of visualization. Um, taking a recent application for mobile screen devices as our main case, we'll discuss how practices of visualization, even if qualified as artistic of, or speculative rather than pragmatic or scientific, inadvertently reinforce preconstituted ideas about the relations between data and the realities they provide insight. Ideas that are firmly embedded in turn in discourse on data's evidentiary potential. Our example is particularly telling in this respect, as it is designed precisely to enable its users to resist another form of data power, the ubiquity of digital networks and the information those pick up and relay. Contemporary understandings of data or information visualization tend to broadly align with uh, Lefmanovich definition of those terms as mappings between discrete data and a visual representation. In this definition, the assumption is made that some sort of a translation takes place um, between select non-visual properties of the data, expressed numerically or as text, into some kind of an image. And in his piece, Manovich, of course, focuses on contemporary uh, forms of visualization, but he remarks also that um, the visual language used has essentially remained the same since the 19th century. The sort of visualization practice that Manovich alludes to here is sometimes referred to as pragmatic. In a piece that argues for a critical theory of visualization, computer scientist Robert Kosara uses this term to designate technical, technical applications of visualization techniques to analyze data. The goal of pragmatic visualization, he claims, is to explore, analyze or present information in a way that allows the user to thoroughly understand the data. Both Kassara and other authors define this category in contradistinction to artistic visualization. Unlike the pragmatic kind, this type is deliberately interpretive and expressive in nature. It seeks to voice viewpoint or concern without aspiring to present a universal truth. Some argue also that artistic visualizations differ from pragmatic ones in that their representation of data is not easily legible and even that it's not meant to be legible. In fact, those authors claim such visualizations are appealing precisely because in using data, they render those data somewhat enigmatic. In this respect, they also <coughs> differ from so-called scientific visualizations designed to serve the purposes of scientific research. And an other often heard term is speculative visualization. This category seems to partially overlap with the artistic kind, but is identified in terms of the work it does rather than on the basis of its production intent. Speculative visualizations indeed are a kind that imaginatively engages with and provokes thought on often hidden but socially relevant issues or problems, for instance by envisioning possible f futures or solutions. Of course, these distinctions, and uh, especially those between artistic and scientific, are fundamentally problematic. One reason is that practices of scientific image making and artistic visualization are inextricably <coughs> intertwined, both today and historically. 
In their seminal work on objectivity, Lorraine Destin and Peter Gallison pointed to the key role at several junctures in this history of certain forms of artistic sensitivity. Chiara Ambrosio adds that scientific visualization has always been imbued with aesthetic commitments, thanks among others to the involvement of visual artists in the process of representation. And various authors, including those here, have also observed that in recent years, presentational images have increasingly circulated at the blurred edge of science <coughs> and art. But in addition, we do of course also need to challenge some of the more fundamental assumptions behind such distinctions. For example, the common association of scientific visualization with objectivity as an epistemic value, or in other words, as uh, a reliable route to establishing truth. The criteria for what counts as objective, of course, have shifted over time, but understandings of it today tend to revolve around the expectation of a non-interventionist attitude from those engaged in scientific endeavors. This course on data visualization also, whether it's broadly defined as pragmatic or uh, more narrowly as scientific, is indebted to such notions of objectivity. This is evidenced, among others, by the common understanding of data as empirical traces and modified by any sort of manipulation or interpretation. And of course, the fact that data is sometimes distinguished from information um, or, or, or data already structured or shaped, shaped is further evidence of this. However, such a perception, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, obscures the fact that data are always the result of processes of selection according to parameters that are never neutral. For as cultural critic and information visualization expert Joanna Drucker observe, observes, data are really capta, they are taken rather than given, and by implication, they are constructed as an interpretation of the phenomenal world rather than inherent to it. Moreover, such an understanding of data ignores the interpretive work that all visualizations do and that, according to the <coughs> same author, is encoded in their form. But as Helen and her co-authors argue, this work stands to be shielded from view as visualization, visualization conventions make the data seem factual and transparent. Now, in order to explore how deeply ingrained those conventions are, we'll zoom in on one example which uh, Karen will now introduce. The case we want to discuss is the architecture of radio, an ac application for Apple and Android devices created in 2015 by the Dutch information designer Richard Feige. Its main feature is a 360 degree visualization of what the product website calls the infosphere, the environment of informational entities that facilitates our practices of observation and communication but that also physically surrounds us even though it's invisible. When installed, the app generates a location image of nearby data points. It shows the position of relay devices such as cell towers and satellites, but also a physical access points such as Wi-Fi routers. In addition, it also visualizes the relative distance between those hardware devices and the viewer at the time of its use. As you'll see in the clip we'll show you in just a minute, the app doesn't produce a data visualization in the most common sense of the term, but it does rely on data inputs in generating its image. For example, it uses open data sets to determine the locations of relay devices and access points. GPS is used to calculate the distance from the viewer, both exact and relative, in real time. In addition to this, the app also simulates the digital radio signals that cell towers and Wi-Fi routers emit. You'll see this again shortly in the clip. In addition, you'll also hear a rumbling combined with crackling sounds and static noises that change quality as the user pans his or her device. In interviews, the maker has suggested that this soundscape was lo loosely inspired by noises picked up whilst listening to a software-defined radio that picks up signals from cell towers, satellites, and so on. So despite the attempt at realism, this is again a simulation, not an actual sonification of the emitted signals. So let's hope this works.
<laughs> that one wrong? <laughs> Sound up. Oh. It's just to give a quick impression. You can see the cell tower, the Wi Fi routers, and the satellite. And I believe this was taken in Moscow. Someone put it on YouTube. Just to give a quick impression. And you see also the data signals emitted actually roaming through this, the atmosphere. It's scaring me right now because I said to my kids, if we could see what's going on around us, we wouldn't come out of our house. <laughs> In the communication about the app, it is positioned as a data visualization, but also, importantly, as an imaginative <coughs> intervention. For instance, the rel relevant, relevant uh, product blurbs in the iPhone and Google App Store insist that the radio architecture of radio is not a measurement tool. Since the waves used for cell phone and Wi-Fi communication are outside the spectrum of visible light, any representation of them is necessarily an interpretation. Therefore, the app is not a source of accurate information about the state of affairs. The same tendency is visible also in interviews and reviews. I think this is it. As a matter of fact, the app can even be understood as a piece of data art. Since its inception, site-specific versions of it have been exhibited, for instance, in centers for new media art, as in the examples on the slide. But the downloadable version also shares data art's fundamental concern with data as both subject and material. A common denominator for much data art is that it seeks to make visible something that otherwise remains hidden. In doing so, it makes legible, but it also enables critique. The architecture of radio in this context is concerned with the invisibly invisibility of data infrastructures, a term referring in this case both to devices or hardware and the wireless signals that they relay. Richard Feige, the app's maker, argues that making those visible not only enables understanding, for instance, understanding of our dependence on such infrastructures, but also serves to empower users. Today, we're not concerned with the question of whether or not this claim is justified. What we're interested in instead is how this making visible actually takes place. Along with the paratextual disclaimers I previously mentioned, the app's positioning as a work of art aligns it with uh, the two categories of visualization practice that AIF listed. The visualizations it generates are clearly artistic, not only in terms of their intent, but also in the sense that they elicit an effective response as much as a reflection on the issues tackled. But they're also speculative because they basically fill in what we do not see, and even what we do not hear. In this context, the maker also speaks of a theoretical simulation. Now, if we take such claims at face value, we might be inclined to conclude that they severely hamper understandings of the app, or the visualizations it generates as evidentiary. We might argue also that they forestall appeals to objectivity on the part of those who use them. But at the same time, we cannot ignore that the app's mere use of data serves to anchor the representation in a reality out there. A reality, moreover, that has been registered by means of GPS, so in other words, automatically or in a non-interventionist way. Moreover, the data used are hardly rendered enigmatic, as Corsara and others suggested. Here, the status of those data, in some cases, part of the images as numerical information, is crystal clear. Taking our inspiration from data art practitioner and scholar Mitchell Whitelaw, we argue therefore that the architecture of radio, in this respect at least, functions within an indexical paradigm, as the data sets it relies on still serve primarily as indexes of reality. In doing so, they legitimize the premise of what's communicated, even if promotional materials make no claim to precision or accuracy in terms of the relation between what is shown and the reality it derives from. A reinforcing factor here is that paratext amply reference the use of specific data sets, which, as Kennedy et al. argue, is rhetorically key. However, they do mention on occasion that the location information used is not real time, but updated once only every few months. The app's user 
it turns out, do not always take this into account. But when they do, the reactions merely reinforce the notion that the use of real-life data inevitably raises expectations <coughs> as to their status as evidence. For instance, iTunes reviewers post both praise and denounce the app in terms of the correspondence or absence of such correspondence between what it shows, what it shows and, real, and real radiation, or as another puts it, the actual spectrum of radio frequency waves. Some respondents do focus in their evaluations on the fact that the location data the app relies on merely provides snapshots of the communication infrastructure at given points in time. And while this is not always perceived as a problem, the mere fact that it is mentioned suggests that it does matter, and specifically that it matters in terms of how it affects the image accuracy. So in other words, while the app's positioning as both data visualization and speculative artwork leaves room in principle for rather diverse understandings of Weich's work, this interpretational openness is considerably reduced at the level of its reception. Another example of this conf uh, example that confirms this tendency is the fictional staging of the app in the American television series CSI Cyber. I'm going to show you a short clip, and then Afe will take over again. Yeah. Oh. Let's take a look at the whole network and other devices that connect. The confiscated the mom's tablet and the dad's laptop, but the, what, what is this other device there? GPC? GPC. Chase back up computer. There's a backup drive. It's gotta be here. We can find it using an app that makes wireless signals visual. Architecture of radio. Oh. It's somewhere in this room. Got it. In this clip, we're all like right. <laughs> the architecture of radio. Uh, software can locate devices in real time and with relative precision. In reality, of course, this is not possible, but what is of interest to hear is that in the app's imagined use, the appeal of data once again lies in its potential to link directly to what Li Whitelaw calls the real of its source. If we look again at the app's interface, we can understand why some reviews call it augmented reality. It doesn't actually function as such because the layer it adds onto reality also serves to cover it up. But it does follow the same layering logic and combined with the 360 degree viewing it imposes, this further reinforces our sense of a direct connection between what we see and the world in which we move about. Compare it for a moment to the interface of white spots, another project involving the same maker. As you can see on the slide, this app, the one on the right, uses the same network scanner functionality that the architecture of radio does. But in this case, the user is invited to take it as a starting point for a search for places off the grid in order to escape from the information flows that surround us. Tapping the Get Me Out button will send the user to a map functionality, basically a tool that allows one to navigate with the help of GPS to nearby places without cell phone coverage. Whitespots' network scanner interface actually provides fewer details than the one in the architecture of radio. For instance, it doesn't include a compass and it doesn't identify the user's position in longitude latitude coordinates. And it also relies on a more limited data input. But when seen in operation, the view here is even more overwhelming than in the other app. For example, um, the spikes here are closer compared to the ones in the other app, but also the sound is even more uh, unnerving than in the other one. In light of the fact that the app appeals to the user's yearning for disconnectedness, this is hardly surprising and in fact highly functional. But arguably, the navigation functionality here also serves to ground the network scanner vi visualization even more firmly in <coughs> reality outside it. White spots indeed capitalizes on the expectation of reliability um, it raises. And this is extra remarkable as this project is uh, positioned even more as an artistic one than the architecture of radio. 
Okay, by way of a conclusion then, our purpose today was to demonstrate through a telling example how understandings of data as drawn directly from reality and by extension uh, as proof for truth claims about the world wield their influence even in visualizations that are explicitly positioned as speculative rather than evidentiary. Explanations for this can be found on the one hand in the conventions for data use and representation that producers rely on, but on the other also in the expectations they raise in the people who use them. The makers of visualizations, whether scientists or artists, seem to draw on some of the same conventions for data use and representation, either consciously or more inadvertently, among other conventions for the selections of data, for instance, the choice for, the choice for GPS uh, generated ones, or of conventions for the representation of those data, for instance, making them seem transparent rather than to hide their provenance as me or meaning, which obviously is not the only option then in uh, artistic forms of visualization. Some of those conventions, of course, are not specific to data visualization, but part of much broader representational conventions. Consider, for instance, the 360 degree image, opaque, but still layered on top of the real world, or, of course, some of the conventions used in the sound. But also conventions in terms of how choices are subsequently framed either as part of the representation or in the communication around it, and here you can think of the mentioning of data sources on websites and interviews and so on. In follow-up to our references to Destin, Gallison and others, this leads us to conclude that art is firmly imbued with the conventions of science, not just the other way around, but importantly, and that's the very last line on the slide, all of those choices in turn raise expectations um, in those who use them and as it turns out those expectations may in many cases overrule any disclaimers that are made. Yeah. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. So now we're going to hear from our third panelist, Thomas Meyer Lemieux from the University of Quebec. So, hi. Uh, so, as we've seen uh, so far during during this conference, um, digital technologies are changing <coughs> society by redefining all spheres of activity, both both individual and collective. While critical work on the pol uh, on the political, economic, and normative impacts of digital technologies in cities uh, as have developed greatly over the last 30 years. Digital study has paid little attention to the cultural and aesthetic impact of the digital on, on everyday life. So given the transformative effect of, uh, that datafication has upon the flow of information and, uh, and its attendance power dynamic, it is time to reappraise how everyday life in urban settings is shaped by what we call a new regime of algorithmic visuality. So from a theor theoretical point of view, uh, several authors have recently emphasized the end -to one relation between governance, surveillance, and security device in the emergence of a new uh, production of space as a, bad drug, uh, as a bad backdrop to our daily interactions. Indeed, the rapid advance and broad adoptions of computer vision algorithms across new media technologies has immense consequence for social life. But while recent critical digital studies has, uh, have been interested in the impact of device like a discrete and passive ecosystem of, so, uh, of social control and mass surveillance, very few works have questioned the fact that the precise, um, the precise deep and fine-grained knowledge of our cityscape by major web companies is also having a profound impact on our aesthetic uh, representation. So in fact, um, the processing of automated, mobile, and accurate image is contributing to the concre concretization of immersive, real-time, three-dimensional, and network com computational representation of reality. And this is what today's talk aims to, to explore. So uh, drawing on cultural, digital, and urban studies, 
the work of some key authors in digital critical studies may be necessary to grasp the wider cultural implication of digital coded data. And it's on the basis of this work that we have sought to distinguish three different perspectives uh, where the device producing these algorithmic visuality are inscribed. So our conceptual frame are inspired by the work of French, uh, of French sociologist uh, Dominique Cardon in his book, À quoi rêvent les algorithmes? Uh, <coughs> Nos vies à l'heure des big data. So, developing a policy-oriented approach to these issues, Zook, Graham, and Bolton proposed the concept of augmented reality to account for new ways of conceiving and interacting with urban space. From the aerial, uh, from the aerial perspective, the emergence of device such as Google Earth, uh, Street View, or Maps, has obviously been the subject of several studies, each in various ways emphasizing the idea that, that this total, uh, total mapping of territory produced new forms of authority over representation of urban space. From this new re representation, various forms of exclusion, shadows, and privatization have, uh, have emerged. So engaging with the inside or street level perspective, Andrusevich and Burton or Rob Kitchen's concept of real-time city has focused on the smart city project in which several cities have invested in recent years. Through various empirical examples, the author highlight the emergence of smart infrastructures as well as device and sensors, all of which created a vast network of algorithmic visuality within private and public urban space. Gathering increasingly precise and deep geolocated data on both spaces, all of these devices highlight the role played by major web companies, the GAFAM, in the unprecedented deployment of these devices within cities. Taking a look at the practice and daily uses of mobile uh, social media, others such as Larissa Hart, Pink, and D'Souza as reflected on the more subjective impacts of these platforms on new ways of representing the indiv individual in urban space. Focusing on the expressive use of mobile social media, these also address uh, issues such as the massive extraction and commerci commercialization of digital data. For them, this new reality reflects, in fact, a true, a true shift in our perception of space, especially because of the massive amount of visual and personal geolocated data. So, although the current relevant literature addresses the largest impact of digital data in the city, it nevertheless seems to ignore certain central issues related to the visibility of, ur of urban space. Yet the question of social and aesthetic representation is far from new in the social science. In proposing the idea that these questions are essential for better understanding the ubiquitous nature of, the, of data, in our everyday, urban everyday life. Prominent actors in the technology industry are currently shifting their corporate strategy to focus on bringing algorithmic visuality into mainstream uh, consumer cultures. So technologies such as um, intelligence surveillance camera, autonomous car, interior 3D mapping, and mixed reality eyeswear are in dialogue with one each other, creating rich data streams that situate individual in dynamic, meaning-laden environment. The outcome is an enormously powerful data set, crucially linking the above and side and below layers of geolocated data. So as mentioned above, uh, while the current literature on data has been largely concerned with the political, economic, and normative impacts of social control and surveillance. Little attention has paid to the vital cultural implication arising from data. 
yet the consequences explored, explored by the social science and critical theory have interested many artists in recent years as they engage with digital surveillance and post-photographic art. By addressing the subject, subjective, experiential, um, experiential and, re and, and reflexive dimensions of urban space, this artist's work has been considered as a privileged ob object of study for questioning the ambiguity of digital data in social space. From a methodological, methodological point of view, our present research proposed to conduct semi-directed uh, interviews with 10 to 15 digital post-photographic artists based in Quebec, uh, Canada, and United States. So some example of artists. The first example is uh, the American artist Trevor Pagle, who documents uh, various infrastructures from which are extract digital and personal data. They Watch the Moon, for example, shows an ultra-secret data center of the National Security Agency, using a state-of-the-art camera allowing for a long focal lens. The artist attempts to question the states of surveillance by making the invisible visible. Resolutely critical and subversive, his approach aims to constitute a, vo a visual vocabulary, allowing viewers to better understand the impact of data on their everyday lives. So we, we have a good, uh, a good reflection here on, on digital data from the artist. The second example is taken from the work of artist Esther Rovert, and especially our work false positive with documents and question mass surveillance and the increasing presence of smart cameras in public space. She compares photographs of eight behaviors evident in body language and movement that are being deemed abnormal by algorithmic detection systems. So the artist on his, on his work uh, says, with my work, I, uh, I aim to ask question of on how power, politics, and control are exercised through urban planning and the use of public space. I mainly focus on the way public space is structured by social and art architectural rules. The human experience of the urban environment is central to my work. The third example uh, comes from the photographic series Dutch Landscape by the Belgian artist Mishka Enair, which, que uh, which questioned the, the political stakes around the power of government and sensitive surveillance sites by making visible the different case of censorship of Olin on uh, Google Maps. So according to the artist, each country has their own approach to, to identity sensitive uh, uh, environment by blurring our literacy, uh, literally hiding some sites. So in this case, the artist found that the Dutch employed a much more aesthetic and graphical style to hide sites, making this aesthetic landscape a manifestation of the power of enterprise uh, and the state on the representation of territory, spaces, and places around the world. Um, taking a more aesthetic approach, the fourth example comes from photographic series uh, Des Rives by Montreal artist François Quivion. This work translates in the, the infrastructures and geography of different locations in the city of Montreal into a map of point with a set of data that are available on each of these places. So artists describe her work like that. By interconnecting the virtual and the real, Derive is interested in the phenomenology of mixed reality and probe the changing natures of our perception, perception and our representation of the world. And the fifth example is taken from the work of Italian artist Paolo Sirio, who had been working uh, for several years to making visible the trace or phantoms left by automated image or geocoded geo data in cityscapes. Whether through his best known work Street Ghost or Overexposed, 
the artist questioned the right of privacy, transparency, surveillance, and ethical questions of, of massive extraction of personal data. So in terms of assumption, preliminary results, and conclusion, uh, finally, the interviews will lead to a cultural analysis of the meaning of the contemporary experience of urban, of urban everyday life. Representing issues that are widely discussed in the field of contemporary art today, this research suggests that the critical, empirical, and subjective discourse of digital artists can help uh, digital sociology to better understand and document the impact of algorithmic visuality on social and aesthetic representation of urban everyday life, and how, moreover, artists are probing these issues. In terms of uh, preliminary results, uh, the response of the artist suggests that uh, digital city must be more curious about the sensitivity and expertise of this kind of discourse because artists are in better position to expose and reveal the broader impact of digital technologies in urban everyday life. The artist suggests also the fact that we should be concerned as a society about the invisibility, blind spot, or shadows, shadows or the biais that are produced by algorithmic technologies. Making visible the invisible and its tensions represent for them one of the main issues of their photographic practice. And for them, too few artists cr uh, critically explore this. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Too few artists critically explore the, the, the new regime of algorithmic visuality, uh, and by this, the commercial power of data for a handful of corporation of, of corporation in tech industry. So, to conclude, uh, although some authors have emphasized the contribution of artists in the field of digital studies, research propo propose a deeper, new, empirical, and critical studies of, alg uh, of algorithmic visuality in everyday life. Thank you. Thank you.